Welcome back, everybody, to the Religious Studies Project. I'm David Robertson, and I'm joined, as ever, by Christopher Cotter. And we are here in Edinburgh, as always. It's rainy and cold, but that's what you'd expect. Exactly. Um, we are brought to you in association this week, for the first time without any special introduction, by the BASR, NAASR, and IAHR. All the... Ours. ours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, a special shout out to you if you are currently at the AAR conference, which I believe is starting pretty much now. Absolutely. This podcast is also brought to you in association with the BSA Sacral. It's part of our Sacral series on New Horizons in the British Sociology of Religion. That's right. We're coming to the end of that and we'll have some uh, announcements about that at the end of this podcast. So stay tuned. But now over to me, speaking to Matt Francis about researching radicalization. Take it away, me. Radicalization, fundamentalism or extremism are terms which are highly prevalent in media, public, political and legal discourse these days and are surrounded by mystification, rhetoric and ideological assumptions that work against clear, objective, nonpartisan understandings of the phenomena they denote. Regular listeners to the Religious Studies Project will be unsurprised that we look askance at such discourses and aim to take a critical approach to this controversial topic. What might the Academy mean by the term radicalization? How might we study it? What makes it different from socialization? Is there a necessary connection between religion or particular forms of religion and radicalization? And how might we position ourselves in relation to other actors? in politics, the military or the media, who have a vested interest in our research. To discuss these and other issues, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Matthew Francis to the Religious Studies Project. Matt is currently Senior Research Associate at Lancaster University, where he is Communications Director for the Centre for Research and Evidence on Security Threats, or CREST. His research concentrates on non-negotiable beliefs and values, and he's interested in theories of the sacred, and Durkheimian explanations of the role religion plays in society. And his research has mapped the significance of sacred beliefs in public statements made by groups, in particular through in-depth analyses of groups such as Aum Shinriko, Al-Qaeda, the Red Army Faction, and others. He's founded and is editor of the website radicalizationresearch.org, which brings high-quality academic research on radicalization, extremism, and fundamentalism to the attention of people working in policy, media, education, and other sectors interested in these topics. And he's also published numerous articles and chapters of relevance to the topic, including a number of accessible pieces for the website The Conversation, which shall be linked to from the RSP website. So first off, Matt, um, you're not a stranger, but uh, welcome to the Religious Studies Project. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes, it was uh, a fair few years ago we recorded a, a sort of rather lively roundtable at a Sockrell conference, I believe. Um, can't quite remember what the topic was, but we had a good time. Me neither. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was whiskey, but I'm Indeed. sure that wasn't the topic. <laughs> um, but whiskey's always, always involved in, in good academic work. Um, so first of all... Um, before we dive right in, what what are we meaning by radicalization here? It's a word that we hear a lot in the media these days. Um, but yeah, what is it, academically speaking? Well, I think quite simply, if we use it as uh, a term which un helps us understand how people come to a point where uh, they can't they hold radical views. I mean, it's it's very simple, really. The problem is, I think, that in a lot of popular discourse and in the media, uh, it is used in in, in quite different and difficult ways. So, for mm. example, it's often seen as synonymous with terrorism. So somebody who's radicalized is seen to be a terrorist, whereas actually from an academic point of view, that's a very unhelpful and, and even I would say untrue uh, uh, sort of two sets of, uh, of categories to put together. Uh, so radicalization generally in popular discourse tends to be this idea of somebody coming to hold uh, radical, uh, violent ideologies. Okay. Um and, and so, so there's definitely so there's that connection with violence. Then, so it's it, is it different from just normal processes of socialization? Then we talk about you know people are are brought up with certain ideas. We all have um, ideas, beliefs, values. Um, so, so what's the what's the difference there? <laughs> 
so I guess so sorry and I was a bit unhelpful in, in how I answered it in the first place because I put the emphasis on the the, the, the popular way of mm. discussing radicalization so so yes yeah, so certainly as I would see it it's synonymous with socialization um, it's it's about um, how people are uh, sometimes brought up in how their peer networks influence them the kind of ideas that they come into contact uh, through society through social media through the internet but through a variety of different sources and, and mm. how this uh, helps them think about the world around them helps them interact with other people so y yes radicalization and socialization in that respect it's it's you know, we're talking about fundamentally the same process However, radicalization seems to have this special quality uh, when it's talked about uh, in, in public and in, in much of academic discourse as well. It's a fairly new term. So if we think about um, it in the context of terrorism, for example, we hear it a lot in relation to Islamic uh, inspired terrorism, but not in the case of Northern Ireland, for example. People yes. didn't talk about people being radicalized into the IRA. So it, it, it is something that, that that's uh, a much more recent construction and it's also something that we can see similarities in in past constructions as well so if we think about brainwashing for example as well mm. something coming out of the cult panics um uh, it, it almost seems to have some some sort of you know a lot of overlap with that as a kind of magical process that you know people mm. are vulnerable to radicalization and, and and they lose all sense of personal agency when they're in the grips of mm. this process and, and and that's and that's very unhelpful so i prefer to think of it as actually it's 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 socialization, but it's socialization towards a particular end, which we might identify as um, having radical ideas. I wouldn't even necessarily add violent in there uh, mm. as being necessary to that. OK, yes, yeah, so I actually did a, a, a sort of Google Ngram search before we started the interview. And yes, the term really seems it was from from the 80s. I was surprised it was actually so prevalent in the 80s, according to Google. But um, it certainly leapt up in the last 15 years or so yeah um and we'll ref re we'll return to cults um and the sort of brainwashing panic and all that hopefully later on um but just returning to what you were saying there so in popular discourse there's, there's quite a connection then with with terrorism but um you said with the ira there there is there isn't a necessary connection. So if you can maybe talk a bit more about the perceived slash actual connections between radicalization and what we might think of as terrorism. Sure. So uh, what I said, one of the problems of the way that it's used is it's often used as synonymous with terrorism. And and that's quite unhelpful because it's when we talk about radicalization, we tend to talk about uh, ideas and beliefs and mm. values. That's what that's what people commonly understand as, as, as being uh, important within this process of radicalization. Uh, whereas terrorism, actually, that's a lot about belonging to a particular group and acting, you know, uh, according to the, the, the strategies or, or the aims of those particular groups. So it's quite possible, for example, for somebody to be radicalized into a particular set of beliefs and values, but not to be a member of a terrorist group. Uh, likewise, if you have a look at um, people who've, who've um, done some research on people who are members of terrorist groups, so let's take the example of John Horgan in the United States, for example, he would say that there are many members of terrorist groups who are not radicalized. So mm. they're in these groups, they're acting violently, they're, they're carrying out these actions that we understand to be uh, terrorist actions. Um, again, that's a whole um, separate ball game oh, how yes. we define uh, <laughs> terrorism, but, um, but that they aren't necessarily uh, committed to some kind kind of radical ideology they're not even necessarily committed committed to the ideology of the group for which they're acting and that's quite important there might be a number of reasons for that mm. of course they might have been um, at one time committed to the ideology of the group um, have since become um, you know you know sort of feel disillusioned with the group but just don't know how to leave they've acted violently mm. they've broken the law they've got nowhere else to go so they're just still um, hanging around there it might be that they join for reasons other than you know, being committed ideologically. So, you know, maybe it was just the best decision for them in the area that they grew up in. This was a yeah. group that provided some financial stability or some safety and security to their family, etc. So there's a number of different reasons why we might see 
terrorists who are not radicalized, just as we might see people who are radicalized, many people are radicalized indeed, who don't belong to terrorist groups or terrorist movements. And, and that's why I think it's quite important to, to pull those two and, and, and to separate them out. And, and also very important to say after that, that just because we might say that somebody has been radicalized, doesn't mean that they're going to become a terrorist, doesn't mean that they're going to be involved in that um, yes. illegal, often violent action. Exactly. Um, you've touched on a number of points there that are, are highly relevant to the academic study of religion. For example, the assumption in popular discourse would be that a member of a religious group in some way subscribed to all of the tenets, beliefs, ideologies of that group. But as we know um, from other research, that, that that's people may be members of religious groups for a variety of reasons and don't necessarily subscribe in that sense. Um, you've also raised um, an issue that's been implied there that so radicalization as, as a term, it's would you maybe say it's somewhat in the eye of the beholder in that um, it's the dominant view of society that maybe dictates what is then a radical view that needs to be addressed or accounted for or something like that yeah so it's it's you know if you think of somebody as having these radical ideas these extreme ideas they're often defined against you know what we consider to be the norm mm -hmm. you know the the the, the the, the center ground, as it were. Um, and so, yes, you, you, you know, you could expect to see that quite reasonably uh, shift over time. So were that the phrase radicalization used back around the time of the suffragettes, for example, I think it'd be very reasonable to describe that they were people who'd been radicalized into mm. extreme points of view um, in relation to the society that they lived in at the time. Um, now, thankfully, we don't think it's so unusual for women to have the right to vote. Um, mm. So, we, you know, we can see that, you know, that as a manifestation of a particularly extreme idea uh, uh, certainly in the public discourse of the time, you know, mm. it's, it's not one that we hold now. So, yes, it's 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 related to the particular society, to the time. It will change over time. Yeah. And that touches on the sort of notion um, of, of of the agendas that might be driving research into radicalization, which we'll hopefully um, discuss towards the end of the interview. Um So this is the Religious Studies Project. And um, in popular discourse, religion maybe particularly Islam in, in, in a UK context, are connected with this notion of radicalization. But uh, again, academically, um, what's the what's the relationship between religion and radicalization? Yeah, so again, it's it's often when tackling that relationship between religion and radicalization, you have to wade through a lot of that mm. popular misconception and, and the popular discourse around the connection between religion and rad radicalization before you can get to the really useful stuff. And I'll do the same again um, now. Uh, certainly what I see as, as, as a large part of the problem around this discourse is that there are two sort of pretty sort of dominant trends in, in, the, in the discussion of religion and radicalization. One says that um, all religion is violent. You know, religion is, you know, just predisposed to these kind of violent actions. Let's think about this kind of Dawkins-esque notion yeah. that inside every moderate believer, there's a fanatic waiting to jump out. Um, so, so that's sort of one extreme. And then at the other uh, extreme, uh, we, we get this idea that, that um, religion is essentially good. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and it's only sort of bad people or bad manifestations of, or perversions of religion that lead to it. Um, and that's, that's, you know, both of those are very unhelpful positions. What we also see in academia is, is, is a position that says religion has nothing to do with it. You know, religion's a red herring. Um, mm. you know, and, uh, and, and there are a variety of arguments why people come to that. So, you know, it might be that people point to the fact that, um, let's take Wahhabism, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, that there, there are millions of Wahhabists. Um, but we don't have millions of Wahhabist terrorists. So it's very unhelpful to say that um, religion plays a role in terrorism, in radicalization. Um, so so, so that would be one reason that people give. Another mm. reason that people give is that it's really difficult to generalize from an ideology. So it's difficult to say um, all um, you know, people from this particular religion are terrorists or likely to act violently. So it's, it's, you know, it's difficult to make generalizations. So therefore, you know, we, we just ignore religion as, as playing a role. Certainly what I've, um, 
what I found in my research and, 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 you know, as indeed there are other people who've also found the same, many people, um, who say that actually the answer is much more nuanced than that. So let's look at the, the beliefs and values, um, that, that, that people have in, in terms of, you know, making decisions to, to join groups, making decisions to act violently. They're important. Of course they're important. Um, ideology more broadly. So rather than, as I don't tend to focus on religion specifically, but say that ideology more broadly, mm. um, these beliefs and values more broadly, are indeed significant. They're not necessarily the prime factor why people join certain groups. They're not the prime factor why people choose to act violently necessarily, um, but they do still play a role. Um, and just because it's difficult to uncover what that is doesn't mean that we shouldn't. The uh, the additional point to that is that when people sort of say things like, oh, well, you know, um, uh, just because uh, not all people of a particular religion are violent means that we, you know, religion isn't important. We say, well, actually, you've not really understood what, you know, what's important to people. So um, it's quite right. Just because somebody's a Muslim doesn't mean that they act violently. That's, you know, that, that seems to me um, mm. ev- completely evident. Uh, not unfortunately evident to everybody, but um, uh, what people don't tend to understand is that there's lots of different ways of practicing. Islam. Um, there's lots of different beliefs and values that people hold within that. Um, and yes, it'd be completely wrong to say that because somebody's a Muslim uh, means that they're violent. Uh, what we should look at is what are the individual beliefs and values of that person, you know, mm. of a person that, that that chose to act violently. And that's important and that's significant. Um, mm. and, and if you look at that particular small group, and of course, and that's always the case with these, is we are looking at incredibly small numbers of yes. people in the overall scope of things. And that's why it's difficult to make generalizations and why we should be very careful and we shouldn't. So I've been very, very clear that um, that we shouldn't say it's the fault of X religion, you know, yeah. uh, but mostly because actually, uh, as you know, and as many of the listeners of this podcast know, it's you know very problematic generally to define people and say, you know, somebody's a Christian, therefore they all believe in mm-hmm. X. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't happen in reality, and it doesn't happen um, in 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 the case of people deciding to act violently either. Absolutely, and there are so many other um, cross-cutting dimensions. You know, particularly um, with in the case of Britain, you know, with Britain's involvement, colonial past, military involvement, and everything. That, that there's there's a lot going on there. Um, we're gonna we're yes. gonna we're gonna skip ahead. Um, to maybe just get right into the nitty gritty of actually going about this research. Um, so you've got plenty of experience researching in this area. So obviously you can answer this from, from your own perspective, but if I might ask, you know, how, how might one go about researching radicalization? Um, is it, it's a likely to be a sort of ethical minefield a methodological minefield. So maybe you have something to say about that. Yeah, so one of the the uh, things that I was interested in when we set up radicalization research was not necessarily focusing on the people who say I'm researching radicalization. Actually, mm. um, it were you know was much more interested in the people who had a long background in researching uh, in a particular region, for example, uh, you know uh, area studies. So let's take somebody like um, Ian Reader, for example, mm-hmm. who's done some fantastic research on Om Shinrikyo uh, as a as a group that that we know that um, acted quite spectacularly in a violent way in in, in Tokyo in Japan. Um, but he wasn't there to research um, terrorism or radicalization he was there because he was an expert on japanese religion and those kind of accounts um, give us much better much more nuanced accounts than people who say i'm going to go out and research radicalization yeah so so, so that, i guess that would be my first thing is don't um <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's um there, there's many more interesting uh, uh things that you know to, to research in the world than just um why do a very small number of people decide to um, act violently in another way and there are an awful lot of people who are already doing it in various ways thinking about my own research i didn't again set out to understand why people um, got radicalized um uh, i was involved in some research a long time ago um uh one at the university of leeds for the home office and it was just about understanding some of the roots and consequences of of violent action and within that, it seemed to me that there was a gap within that that was about understanding the role that um, 
uh, that beliefs and values played in those uh, in that decision to act violently in some of those groups. And and that's what I aim to do was I just, well, you know, there, there, there's there's something there that I think that my previous research on on the sacred uh, and in particular, I'd looked at um, uh, Durkheim's concept of the sacred through uh, somebody called George Bataille. And I was like, well, mm. actually, I think there's something useful that, that we could take from that theoretical approach and apply it to some of these discourses about how people act mm. violently. And I did it by looking then at um, the, the, the the public utterances of these groups. So, you know, sort of um, uh, testimonials, uh, interviews, uh, statements, manifestos, things like that. And I explored those for those instances where people had talked about um, what they took to be sacred, what they took to be non-negotiable and how they discussed how they might react to the threatened transgression of that. So I was very much interested in that, that, that Durkheimian discourse. And that's how I came into this mm. subject. Yeah. And that's a, that's a nice connection there to this is part of our um, sociology of religion series. And that's that Durkheimian uh, or neo Durkheimian uh, notion of the sacred is quite a nice connection. And listeners will be familiar with our interview with Gordon Lynch, who was it was on the sacred so that took so that we'll not need to elaborate too much on that um we've only got about 10 minutes left matt so i'm just wondering if you maybe present <laughs> in a broad sweep some of your some of your findings um in relation to radicalization i mean maybe what are some of the what are some of the causes or what are some of the connections to study of religion more broadly in relation to radicalization I, I don't know how you want to play that i'll just press go <laughs> okay um well so so much more broadly in terms of of radicalization so something that i've been interested in as well is is looking at um uh, and this is through radicalization research is yeah. what other research is taking place in other disciplines and other approaches and, and and other areas so outside of my research but how does that connect with that that role that ideology plays and as i said earlier it's you know ideology is one of of, of, of uh, you know, sort of many factors that can play a role in people uh, choosing to join or being attracted to, to join particular groups, but also choosing, you know, to hold certain ideas. Um, and, and and those will vary actually from from you know, obviously from person to person, but also from region to region. So, mm. for example, finance might be more important in some areas of Africa, for example, where it can you know it can provide some economic stability. So belonging to a certain group. Um, can provide economic stability, but that doesn't necessarily mean that people are holding the same ideas as, as, as some of those violent groups. So, mm. so ideology is much less important there. If we take something like um, uh, the situation in the West, for example, um, that um, perception of, of, of being treated unfairly um, in comparison to the people that you see around you. So if, if you you know, if you feel that because of your religious background, your ethnic background, or um, just because of, you know, the, the, the money that you have in your family or the networks that have you have around you, if mm. you think that you're being um, uh, unfairly treated, then that might also be a, a stronger motivational factor. So, and, you know, and then also we know that there are issues around things like um, how you uh, think foreign policy, for example, um, mm. is, is important. Now, what's significant in a lot of those is that tends to get filtered through that framework of your ideology. And, and what you might see is that those um, increase hand in hand. And then we come into other things which have seemed to be important, like the internet, for example. So the internet isn't, um, you know, uh, maybe as significant as some people think it is, you know, you, people don't just click to the internet and, you know, certain sites and become radicalized yeah, into violent see. action as well. We know, um, but, uh, but it can act as an echo chamber for particular ideas. It can mm. reinforce people's particular views of the world. And, and that's very important. And when you filter that through the research that, that, that I've been looking at, which is, you know, when people say, well, you know, this particular thing, this is, this is non-negotiable for me. And, 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 you know, through all these other factors and through these sources of what I'm reading, and it might be, on the internet that might be in um your your, your personal networks uh, your peer group networks um for example you know this is what i think is an appropriate reaction to mm. that um, and, and that will be um an emotional response uh, quite often it will be might be one driven by fear of transgression of particular um sacred ideas it might be motivated by fear of threat to your community to your family um that's something that we've seen quite important in research over why people go to join 
uh, foreign conflicts mm. and fight for a long time. So, so, so it's, it's quite interconnected and, I, and I've enjoyed sort of seeing how my research on ideology fits into, you know, other people's research of those, of those factors as well. Mm. But what my research showed was, yes, those non-negotiable things are important. How people talk about them are important. So, uh, two people might both take, a, a particular sacred idea, you know, they might have the same sort of thing that they think is really important, mm. but how they react to that, how they talk about that, um, perhaps up through the background of their broader sort of ideological reading or, or, or networks of influence is really important because that might say something about whether they'll react to that violently or not. So, um, you know, the idea of the sacredness of children, for example, is, yes. is generally probably important to everybody who's who's listening to this you know that, that children shouldn't be treated in certain ways but you know whether we think that the justice system is an appropriate and trustworthy way to deal with that or whether we need to take the law into our own hands um that's often sort of influenced by uh, our own personal ideologies yes yes and that's where uh sort of that's where in-depth research and discourse analysis and everything really comes to the fore i guess um we can really see in there. So when you're talking about the, the sacred, the non-negotiable, um, there's definitely a, a, a link to what we might call religion, because religion is generally constructed as a, a, a potent source of such non-negotiable values, but it's not a, a necessary connection. And of course, people have non-negotiable values um, it, throughout their 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 life religious non-religious secular indifferent or whatever so that's it's really good to get that connection um so um what david and i find ourselves saying quite often um is that when we're looking at the job market at the moment for example every job that seems to be advertised is uh, in islamic studies um uh, that there's a real sort of that's where the money is and our uh the conspiracy theory to bring in david's research <laughs> that we've constructed is that oh that's because that's where the money's coming from because they the government want to understand them islam um and another conspiracy theory i would have would be that um it's kind of a similar situation with radicalization um is that is that where the money is it, and how researching in this area how do you feel as an academic i guess perhaps we to say it harshly serving a particular political agenda so i don't suppose i've seen myself as serving a particular political agenda yeah, yeah. um I, i've been what's always been most interesting to me is is let's have a look at the evidence um that i can find um and and, and you know through our research you know what is it what is it as for anybody what does it tell us about the world around us i'm very aware that the the area that i work in attracts um more attention mm. um and indeed more funding uh, than other areas i doubt very much that i'd have been so lucky in, in, in getting funding if I'd carried on looking at battalion studies, for example. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, um, but I hope that actually what I've, you know, sort of learned through, through, through my research on uh, in battalion, Durkheim, for example, has been applicable in this field. Um, I, I have very specifically tried to make sure that, you know, where findings such as my research suggest that actually that focus on religion is unhelpful i've said so even though that goes against the dominant discourse in the media and, and, and the dominant discourse that we see coming out of of you know some um policy documents for example so i don't think it's helpful to focus on mm. communities just because of their religious identity and i think the evidence actually suggests otherwise you know i think the evidence actually says it's not helpful to do that um so that that's that's how i manage that mm. um you know i i sorry go on I was going to say, yeah, sort of, there's an element of pragmatism, you know, there's sort of, well, funding is there, I'll take it, I'm interested in that area, brilliant, and also better that I'm doing that research than someone else who's not, so uh, it mightn't be as um, rigorous or objective or have the same interests as I do. 
sometimes and, and and that could be a problem you know when you certainly you, you get requests to speak on the media and you think well actually no you're setting me up to to, to mm. give you a particular answer that you want there um but then you think well actually if i don't do it so who else will you ask to do it <laughs> will they just sort of reinforce one of these really unhelpful divisive yeah. uh, sort of discourses that actually i i, I think are uh, are wrong and, and, and unhelpful so you know yes that's that's one um, element of it. The other is that I've not necessarily just gone out to seek jobs on radicalization as well. So, you know, my oh, yeah. first job after finishing my PhD was in with re- the religious literacy leadership program. Um, and still I could find, um, elements that, that, that tacked onto this interest in, um, in violence and religion as well. So, for example, you know, you're sort of looking at the idea that a lack of religious literacy, um, not just actually in, in, because that's where people often think about it in terms of people who go off and join extreme groups, but actually in terms of the policy makers and the practitioners who are dealing with this threat, that actually people had better religious literacy. They, they'd be, you know, they'd understand that you just don't label entire, um, mm. ideology as, as, as potentially violent. Um, you know, so, so, but you could still find the, the linkages there. So yes, undoubtedly I still ended up sort of coming back in some cases to, um, that previous research on religion and violence. Yeah. And, uh, with that, with all of that in mind, and we're very delighted that you've, you've uh, given us an interview on this. Um, just as we're wrapping up, um, where where do you go from here? Uh, I'm sort of asking that in a personal sense, like what, what are you working on at the moment, um, but also maybe sort of trajectories that you see in this sort of radicalization research area um, in the next few years? So my a lot of my work at the moment is is about communicating translating and communicating research more broadly on security threats um to practitioners, to the public, to the media. So, um, as you mentioned right at the beginning, I'm, I'm now working for the Centre for Research and Evidence on Security Threats, and uh, and that brings together research not just in my field, so in ideology um, and, and violence, uh, although that's one element of it, but also on things like um, interviewing, how to tell when somebody's lying on protective security. So that's been that's been fascinating because mm. I enjoy um, I, I like being useful. I, I like making sure that research is useful uh, to people and that people can. Mm. understand and get into um what exists uh inside university libraries and and academics heads and that's one of the reasons why i set up radicalization research so that's kind of a continuation of that in my own research it's a lot about um uh, focusing on some different case studies for example so on far right uh groups um when i did my original research i was very careful to make sure that i did research into religious and non-religious groups because as you say it's you know uh, for me it was much more about um beliefs and values and ideology mm. rather than focusing on religion per se and i'd like to do some more on on far right groups and you know uh, as the example in the united states elections at the moment shows us you know this this sort of broader populist um discourse that we can you know see at the moment that's another area that's um i think probably ripe for some research on what's non-negotiable mm. in, in terms of populist discourses as well so there's there's plenty for me um still to focus on from a personal research perspective but also in that broader interest of, of translating and communicating that research and a lot of that is just about repeating the same messages sadly again and yes. again uh, <laughs> in, in in different places uh, i often find that um, practitioners are a lot more switched on and, and connected to the research that a lot of us are doing than the media um and policymakers, which tend to have more sort of a, a shorter attention span and, and a much more sort of you know geared towards sound bites but we keep on putting those messages out there about what research is telling us about these issues and, and yeah that's that's all we can do really <laughs> as academics you know you're doing a great job and so that's um radicalization research.org um and that's radicalization with an s um for any yes. american listeners I think the Z should work as well, but yes, S. <laughs> All right, perfect. I'll try that um, later. And uh, so if people want to find out more, there's an absolute wealth of information there. And um, we'll also make sure that we link to as many of your publications as we can. But it's been wonderful to have that uh, sweeping um, and really fascinating overview of a quite intense topic. So thanks so much, Matt. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for recording that, Chris, and uh, thanks to Matt for taking part. Very pleased to finally have had that interview um, 
on the RSP. It's something we've been wanting to do for a, a long, long time now. Um, Matt is a good friend of both of ours and it does some important work. And obviously it's a very timely subject. So pleased to bring you that. Absolutely. So we mentioned that that was part of our Sockerel series. We've already had uh, Don Llewellyn, Anna Strahan and Grace Davey in that series. Uh, we've got another couple of episodes coming up in it, though. Um, right. it, so the, the, these first, the first one was an introduction. These, the middle three were these the examples of these new directions of younger scholars taking sociology in, in different directions and uh, looking at new data or looking at uh, using new uh, methodologies. And these last couple, though, because we're the RSP, we always want to be a little bit critical, look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, take a, a different, um, a higher level view on the subject. So the first of those is next week when I had a conversation with Paul Francois Tremlett from uh, the Open University and Titus Yelm of UCL UCLA um, about the differences and similarities between the sociology of religion and religious studies as disciplines, as approaches, and um, you know how, how we see the relationship moving forward and how it's been historically. A, a really interesting conversation, so come back for that. Excellent. Um, I forgot to mention Naomi Thompson. That was the fourth um, in our series. Sorry, Naomi. I um, thought there was four. Right? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what that sort of slight if hesitancy... You do, if you want to re-record that, I can drop it in. It's totally fine. We'll just leave this in as well so the <laughs> listeners can know what goes on. Um, the other episode then that will come out just before our festive holiday special is a compilation episode um, taking that um, title, New Horizons in the Sociology of Religion, and then adding the hyphen beyond secularization question mark. Question mark. Um, and we've been uh, we've gathered together a, a sort of array of um, scholars from different disciplines, including um, Grace Davey and Linda Woodhead, Kim Knott, Carol Cusack, Joe Webster, Jonathan Jong, and um, is it Titus and Paul? Uh, Paul, just Paul. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and so we'll be bringing you that uh, podcast where scholars um, critique, reflect on uh, where where is the sociology of religion if we sort of accept that secularization's sort of a dead idea in that sense. Right, it's like the grand finale of the whole series. It's like you've had Iron Man, you've had Thor, you've had the Hulk. And this is the Avengers. This is Avengers Assemble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so we look forward to bringing you that. Um, next week, however, um, it's another interview that I've recorded. Um, sorry, listeners, you're getting a lot of me lately. I did have a bit of a year off last year. I spoke to Donovan Schaefer um, at the BASR conference in Wolverhampton, um, where he um, posed an interesting rhetorical question in his conference paper, is secularism a world religion? And so we explore that in a fun interview next week. And uh, I've got some comments about that as well next week, but we're rabbiting on today, um, so I'll probably just insist that we wrap things up. Talking of wrapping things up, you're probably buying Christmas presents around now or whatever seasonal holiday it is that you celebrate in your tradition or lack thereof. But whatever else is going on, can you please use our Amazon links? That's .co.uk, .com and .ca because if you do, we get some of the man's money and you support this project without any cost to yourself and help keep this important resource completely free for everyone to use. Facebook, Google+, YouTube, iTunes, Twitter, and... Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.